welcome to this BNA 2021 Festival of Neuroscience. I'm Anne Cook, I'm the Chief Executive of the British Neuroscience Association, or the BNA, and I'd also like to welcome you on behalf of our festival partner, the UK Dementia Research Institute, our 17 partnering organisations that you can see listed on our holding slides and on the platform, and also our principal supporters, Milteni Biotech, the Psychiatry Consortium and Scientifica. I'd also like to give you a huge thank you to our speakers, our delegates, our supporters and our post presenters. Like so many things over this last year, the plans for the festival have changed numerous times. We've all been on steep learning curves and that's not just us, the organisers, but also you as participants. So thank you for sticking with us. Uh, thank you for forgiving any mistakes that happen along the way. And we really hope that you enjoy this online festival. Our last festival was so different in so many ways. We were meeting in Dublin, in Ireland, and I think our biggest concern was whether there was enough Guinness in the pubs for so many neuroscientists. However, there are still a lot of things that are the same. We have got superb neuroscience, we've got some wonderful speakers, we've got people coming from all over the world, we've got topics across the whole field, and we've got people from the academic, clinical and commercial sectors all coming together at this one shared event. If you ask people to describe the festivals of neuroscience, they often come up with words like friendly, welcoming and inclusive. And we've worked hard to try and make this online event as welcoming as the in-person one. I would encourage you to please fill out your profiles and put up a little picture so that we can be as welcoming as we can to people who are new to this field. I'd like to extend an especial warm welcome to people who haven't come to a festival before. And that includes our new cohort of BNA scholars. If you have the chance to say hello, then please do drop them a line. I'd like to welcome undergraduate students who are joining us. It's harder for undergraduates to attend the in-person event, but being online has made it much more accessible. And I'd like to extend a huge welcome and thank you to those who are taking part in our new lived experience sessions and sharing some of their experience of living with a neurological disorder. So obviously there's a lot more to the BNA than just the festival. If you aren't yet a member, I would encourage you to consider looking at our membership options. You can join from just one pound a month and you can be part of our neuro family all year round. So thank you very much for listening. I'm now going to hand over to Sarah Guthrie, who is the co-chair of our programme organising committee, and she will be chairing our opening plenary. Thanks very much to Anne for this great introduction to what I think is going to be an absolutely fantastic meeting and a very warm welcome to the first plenary lecture. And I think that no one could be more appropriate to deliver this lecture than Professor Anil Seth whose work on understanding the biological basis of consciousness places him really at the heart of our contemporary neuroscience research and exploration. So Annal studied natural sciences at the University of Cambridge before moving to Sussex for his MSc and then PhD in science and artificial intelligence. He then undertook postdoctoral fellowships uh, at the Neurosciences Institute in San Diego, California. Now, uh, Anil is Professor of Cognitive and Computational Neuroscience at the University of Sussex, where he's also co-director of the Sackler Center for Consciousness Science and editor-in-chief of the Neuroscience of Consciousness. Anil has a hugely impressive track record of publication and as a highly cited researcher. The uniqueness of his work is in bringing together researchers on consciousness from across disciplines as diverse as neuroscience, computer science, psychology, and philosophy. 
I think what this does is emphasizes the real need for an interdisciplinary approach to understanding the brain and the mind. His discoveries also have wide ramifications for uh, example, the understanding of psychiatric diseases and technological applications in artificial intelligence. Through his media presence and public engagement, he's also sought to bring consciousness science to a wider audience and to make complicated concepts approachable. So we're really looking forward to his lecture. Before we start, uh, just a couple of pieces of uh, housekeeping. So you should have in the tabs that you can see a Q&A tab, and I'd encourage you to post any questions that arise during the presentation there, and they will be relayed to us at the end. Um, but also any more general points of discussion uh, into the, uh, the general chat tab. Um, and at the end, we'll also cover how you can connect with Anil further for uh, more discussion. So now I'd like to um, hand over to Professor Anil Seth for his lecture on real problems and beast machines, predictive processing and conscious experience. Hi, my name is Anil Seth. I am from the University of Sussex, and it's a great pleasure to be giving this talk for the British Neuroscience Association this week. So I'm going to be talking about consciousness. And of course, in the history of neuroscience and history of psychology, consciousness has had quite a mixed reception, or the study of consciousness has had quite a mixed reception over the years. 30 years ago, when I was just starting out as an undergrad, the psychologist Stuart Sutherland, writing in the International Dictionary of Psychology, said the following. He said, consciousness is a fascinating but elusive phenomenon. It is impossible to specify what it is, what it does, or why it evolved. Nothing worth reading has been written on it. Now, the situation has changed and changed very much for the better. Uh, there's quite a few histories of the recent past and future of consciousness science. There's a, a piece, actually, I wrote three years ago for Brain and Neuroscience Advances, which is the journal for the BNA, Consciousness, the last 50 years and the next. And another, I think, very useful historical reference is by Joe Ledoux and Haquan Lau and Matthias Michel. A little history goes a long way towards understanding why we study consciousness the way we do today. Uh, but we are now at a position where consciousness is central again, at least very important within the mind and brain sciences. And in the next half hour, I want to touch on four different points about how I am seeing the study of consciousness and pursuing a scientific understanding of conscious experience. I'll first take up the general framework. How might we sensibly even address the problem? How can we approach consciousness scientifically? I call this the real problem. Then I'll talk a bit about conscious content, what we're conscious of when we're conscious. Then I will talk about conscious self, the specific experience of being you or being me. And in the last part of the talk, I'll explore a few more speculative ideas about the relationship between consciousness, selfhood, and our nature as living machines, as beast machines, as Descartes said long ago. If any of this strikes you as being interesting, this is a sort of distillation of a book that I have coming out in September. And so there's much more about all of this in the pages of this book. So let's start with the real problem. And the name, the real problem, is an homage to David Chalmers' conception of the hard problem of consciousness. This is uh, David Chalmers. And here's how he described the hard problem of consciousness. It is widely agreed that experience arises from a physical basis but we have no good explanation of why and how it so arises. Why should physical processing give rise to a rich inner life at all? It seems objectively unreasonable that it should, and yet it does. This is the hard problem. Why should any kind of mechanistic physical process give rise to consciousness? What is the place of consciousness in our physical material understanding of the universe? It's a very hard problem. Chalmers distinguishes the hard problem from what he calls the easy problem or easy problems of consciousness. Now, these aren't easy in the sense they're easy to solve. They're easy in the sense there is no conceptual mystery about addressing them in terms of physical uh, mechanisms. The easy problems are problems about how the brain works, how it accomplishes 
of various functions in the vicinity of consciousness, things like perception and action and cognition and paying attention. Now, these are all challenging problems, but addressing them doesn't raise, doesn't have to raise this deeper problem of why and how any of these mechanisms should be associated with conscious experience. That's the hard problem of consciousness. Now, my take on this is a more pragmatic approach, which I've been calling the real problem of consciousness. And the real problem can be expressed very simply. It's not a new idea. It's called many things by many people. It's how can mechanisms and processes in the brain and the body explain, predict, and control properties of consciousness, be they functional, and what we can do in virtue of being consciousness, and critically phenomenological, what conscious experiences are like for the person having that experience. Now, this is not the hard problem because we're not trying to say how and why consciousness is part of the universe. And it's not the easy problem either because we are trying to explain properties of conscious experiences. Now, this is a pragmatic thing. And I think by solving it, well, the hope is that by addressing the real problem, we don't directly solve the hard problem, but we might dissolve it so that it seems less of a problem over time. There's a historical parallel for this, which I don't want to get into very much at all, but it's a parallel, an imperfect parallel with how the scientific understanding of life has evolved. It wasn't that long ago that biologists thought that life could not be explained in terms of physics and chemistry, that there was a hard problem of life. But of course, biologists no longer think this way. And by by delineating the different properties of life and accounting for them each in terms of mechanisms, things like metabolism and homeostasis and reproduction, the hard problem of life faded away and there was less need to appeal to any kind of special source or elan vital or spark of life. And now life is not the same thing as consciousness. This is very, very clear. But there's both a useful parallel and a strategy here. The parallel is that what once seemed mysterious became little by little less mysterious over time. And the strategy to make that happen is instead of treating it as one big scary mystery, we delineate different properties of consciousness and try to explain or account for them, predict and control individually. So that's the way I like to think about a pragmatic approach to the scientific study of consciousness. So what are these properties? Well, we can think of three broad categories of properties of consciousness. There are those associated with conscious level having to do with the difference between, let's say, anesthesia and sleep and wakeful awareness. There is conscious content, the experience of your life right now, the content of your perceptual scene at this very moment. And then there's the experience of selfhood, conscious self, the experience of being an individual. Today, I don't have time to talk about level, but I'll talk a bit about both content and self, and we'll start with content. And the principle that I find very useful to understand the relationship between neural mechanisms and phenomenological properties of how we experience the world is the idea of the brain as a prediction machine and of perception as some kind of inference. Now, if you just imagine being a brain, you're locked inside the bony skull and you have no direct access to what's out there in the world. All you have to go on are noisy and ambiguous sensory signals, which are only indirectly related to things happening in the world. So on this view, perception, figuring out what's there, has to be a process of inference in which the brain combines prior expectations about the way the world is with sensory data to form its best guess of the causes of those sensory signals. And that's what we consciously experience in this view, the brain's best guess of what's out there. Now, there are many useful ways to think about this. We can think about this in the frame of Bayesian inference, that the brain in doing perception is performing Bayesian inference on the causes of sensory signals. You have sensory data, which is the likelihood, you have prior expectations, and you have a posterior belief, which is the combination of the two, which amounts to the brain's best guess of the causes of the sensory data. Uh, Hermann von Helmholtz in the late 19th century was probably the first to talk about this formally as a theory of perception. He talked about perception as unconscious inference, emphasizing that we are not aware of the underlying nuts and bolts. We're just aware of the outcome of a process like this. These days, we hear much more about things like predictive processing and predictive coding and active inference. And this is a way in which we might 
uh, see the brain as actually implementing inference and implementing something like optimal Bayesian inference on the causes of sensory signals. The basic idea of predictive processing is that there's a continual interplay between perceptual predictions, which are flowing in a top-down direction, the blue arrows, and prediction error signals, what we might otherwise call the sensory information, which flow in a bottom-up direction, the red arrows here. And the idea is that by continually minimizing prediction errors everywhere and all the time, prediction error minimization, you end up approximating Bayesian inference. The top-down predictions end up uh, becoming the brain's best guess of the causes of the sensory signals. And the idea is the joint content of all these top-down predictions is what you experience. And this is quite an inversion of classical, a little bit straw man views of perception. This is the idea that perceptual content really is conveyed in a top-down direction. It comes from the inside out rather than the outside in. Bottom-up sensory signals in this view mainly convey prediction errors, reporting the difference between what the brain expects and what it gets at every level of description. So the green hours perception comes here from the top down. Now, this is a very general idea and predictive processing is a very general theory. And it's important to say that predictive processing is not a theory of consciousness. It is a very general theory of perception and action and cognition and so on. This, I think, is actually an advantage because instead of addressing the hard problem of how my consciousness is part of the universe, we can think of it as a means to explain properties of phenomenology in terms of underlying mechanisms, mapping between mechanism and phenomenology in the style of the real problem. And we can do experiments in this frame. We can start with very simple experiments. Here's one we did a few years ago with Yaya Pinto when he was in the lab. A simple prediction we can test is that in this predictive brain view, people should consciously see that which their brain expects to see better, more quickly, more accurately than that which is unexpected. And this is a simple prediction we tested using continuous flash suppression here. So the person sees a, a, a image in one eye and some flashing squares in the other eye. And at some point the image breaks through. And what we do is ask whether that moment of conscious breakthrough depends on whether the person is expecting a face in this case compared to a house or something else. And indeed, people are both faster and more accurate uh, when they um, when they report what they see, when it's what they're expecting. So in this paradigm, people do indeed see the expected more quickly and more accurately than the unexpected. This is a very simple experiment. It doesn't have much to do with phenomenology for the what it is likeness of perceptual experience. And so what else can we say within the predictive frame view? And here the idea is that different kinds of predictions will underpin different kinds of experiences. And we're all familiar with this in a way when we see things like faces in clouds uh, or faces in buildings. The idea is that the brain uh, has very strong expectations to see faces, faces of very salient stimuli. So the brain projects face templates, if you like, into sensory data. And so we see, uh, we see partly our expectations here. This is called in the general Form, it's called pareidolia, seeing patterns and things. So that's the everyday phenomenon. Uh, and what we can do is we can take that as a starting point and start to develop computational models that link predictive perception to different kinds of phenomenal experience. In the case of vision, different kinds of visual phenomenology. This is a method I like to call computational phenomenology uh, or computational neurophenomenology, the use of computational models to explain what experiences are like, ideally in ways that become interpretable in terms of underlying neural mechanisms. A good starting point for this is some work we did a few years ago with Kesuke Suzuki that was based on these deep convolutional neural networks that we see all over the place now in deep learning applications. Uh, this is a standard deep learning network. If you show it an image, it's very good at classifying the image, telling you what's in it. But what you can do is you can run it in reverse. You can fix the output layer to say, for instance, it's a dog. And then you update the image. You propagate activity backward through the network and you update the image until it settles down into a stable pattern. 
uh, the people at Google did this first, and it was called the Google Deep Dream algorithm. And what we did at Sussex a few years ago uh, with Kesuke Suzuki is we adapted it to work on this panoramic video. We took a panoramic video. This is Sussex campus on a pre-pandemic Tuesday afternoon, and we processed every frame through this inverse classification network, basically projecting the prediction of dog onto and into every frame of the image, then joining up the image in various ways. People would view it through a head-mounted display and have a very unusual experience. Now, I think what this illustrates is that it's not a model of behavior or a function. What we're really trying to do here is model different kinds of phenomenal experience. So this is why it's an example of computational uh, phenomenology. So this was a, an interesting starting point. What we've been doing more recently that I just wanted to share with you is uh, mapping the diversity of visual hallucinations. So we see things, not just these weirdly psychedelic dogs, but other sorts of altered perception that might give us a handle on the computational basis of a diverse range of uh, unusual visual perceptions. And visual hallucinations differ in many ways. They differ in their complexity. You can have complete objects versus simple patterns. They differ in their veridicality, whether they're realistic or not. They differ in spontaneity, whether they are adaptations of ongoing visual input, or whether they happen by themselves, so to speak. And finally, they differ in terms of their experienced reality, whether they are experienced as being part of the real world or not. So what we're now doing with Kesuke and David Schwartzman and Alec Chance is using a different kind of neural network architecture here to try and come up with computational models of, of these different kinds of, of phenomenology and visual experience. So these are coupled perceptual and generator networks. Uh, they're, they're networks that consist of two arms, if you like. On one arm is a discriminative network, much like I just showed you. It's very good at classifying images, and you can run it forwards or backwards. And the other side of the network is a generator network. This is a generative component, which is tasked with basically reproducing the image that it's given. So it sort of decodes and encodes and decodes it. And if you couple these and parameterize these networks in different ways uh, and then feed them images, it turns out you can indeed generate different kinds of simulated visual experience. For instance, you can generate simulated complex neurological hallucinations of the sort that might happen in. Parkinson's disease or Lewy body dementia. You can simulate simple kinds of altered visual experience that might accompany, for instance, child Bonnet syndrome, uh, where you have visual loss and people hallucinate uh, things uh, because of that. And then you can simulate both complex and simple psychedelic types of hallucination, in this case, by turning the generator network down and running the discriminator network in reverse as we did with that movie earlier. So this is just mapping out the computational space of visual hallucination. What we're also doing is trying to link that more closely to what people actually experience. So uh, in this case, we've conducted a bunch of interviews now with people both with Lewy body dementia and Charles Bonnet syndrome, trying to understand what their visual phenomenology is actually like, but also giving them images from our models and asking them to figure out what the most uh, representative is for the way they experience the world. And this is ongoing work. I just, oh, I wanted to show you as well, just a few movies here of how it looks in practice. This is taking a set of input images. And what we do is we run it through the network set up in different ways, and it generates different kinds of output images. So this is what happens uh, when we simulate complex neurological hallucinations, objects become different objects. When we simulate visual loss in Charles Bonnet syndrome, you get a kind of geometry uh, to your experience. And then here's both complex and, uh, and simple psychedelic hallucinations where we run the discriminator network backwards. And you can see they have different experiential character. So the take home from this part of the talk is very simple. It's that if we can think of hallucination as a kind of uncontrolled perception where the brain's best guesses are not reined in as they normally are by sensory signals from the world, then we can think of perception in the here and now as a kind of controlled hallucination where the brain's best guesses are reined in by sensory data coming from the world. Now, before moving on to self, I just wanted to say two quick words 
about time, just to highlight another branch of work led by Warwick Roseboom, where we use a similar approach to try to understand people's experience of duration. And what we do here is we show, again, uh, a feedforward neural network. In this case, the same one that we use for the hallucination machine. We show a network, a bunch of movies, and we show people a bunch of movies as well. And they rate the durations of these movies. And uh, the network rates duration simply by being exposed to each successive frame and figuring out, according to a threshold, what constitutes significant change in the image at various levels of abstraction uh, associated with different depths in the network. And then we can use uh, those sort of accumulation of salient changes at different levels to estimate duration. And this is all based on the idea that we experience duration not in relation to the ticking of an internal clock, but as some kind of accumulation of salient changes in perceptual input. So it's quite a different perspective on, on time perception that Warwick Rosebeam has been advancing for some years now. And what's kind of remarkable here is that it works really very well. If we compare human reports of duration to what the network estimates the duration to be, of course, longer videos are reported as being longer, both by humans and by the network. So this is the diagonal aspect of these graphs. But both humans and the artificial network show the same kinds of bias. And I think that's really key. So they overestimate uh, the duration of short videos and underestimate the duration of long videos in very similar ways, especially when you constrain the input to the network by where the person was looking on the on the video using eye tracking data. So this shows indeed that you can recover subjective duration, people's experience of duration from this kind of perceptual dynamics. What we're now doing with Maxine Sherman is taking this indeed to the scanner. And so again, we show people these movies and uh, they actually show biases here. So they rate generally office scenes as lasting uh, shorter than city scenes, which are busy. Uh, the network shows the same biases, similar to what I just showed you. But now we also extract activity from the visual cortex and use that in place of the network. And can we predict uh, subjective duration using real brain data here again? And indeed, we can. If we use data from the visual cortex, it predicts experience duration uh, very well. But activity in the auditory cortex or in the somatosensory cortex does not. So this is a nice model-based fMRI experiment showing that the experience of duration is closely tied to this computational process of accumulation of salient perceptual events in, uh, in the corresponding modality. Okay, so that was a bit about conscious content. I'm now going to spend the last 10 minutes talking about conscious self, the experience of being a, a self. And there's a very, I think, naive way of thinking about selfhood that we should put aside at the very beginning. And this is the self as the perceiver. So in this naive straw man view, there's a world which this provides signals that the self centers and the self then forms perception of the world. So the self is doing the perceiving. Now, rather than think that way, I think it's much more productive and quite, I think, widely accepted now that our experiences of the world and of the self are both forms of perception. And I think the more uh, extensive claim here would be that they're both formed in the same way by a process of Bayesian best guessing. Now, there are many aspects to the way in which we experience being a self. There's the experience of being and having a body. There's the experience of a first person perspective. There are experiences of making volitional actions. And then there are experiences of, of being a continuous person, of having an identity that persists over time also at the social level. Now, today I'm just going to say a few words about the bodily self, the experience of owning a particular object in the world or being associated with a particular object in the world, that is uh, the body. This is a very rich area of research and the idea underlying it is the same as before, which is that our experience of what is in the world is our body is a process of predictive perception. The brain is making its best guess about what the body is and what it isn't based on sensory signals. In this case, the sensory signals come from the body. Now, there's a very well-known demonstration of this, which I'm sure everyone has seen, 
called the rubber hand illusion. And in the rubber hand illusion, person's real hand is stroked with a brush, and there's a fake hand in front of them which is also stroked by a brush at the same time. And the usual story told about this is that it's a case of multisensory integration that uh, the guy in blue here, he's seeing a fake hand, he's feeling touch because his real hand is being stroked and he's seeing the fake hand be touched. So that's enough evidence that the brain reaches a best guess that the fake hand is indeed part of the body, which is why he recoils when it's stabbed. Uh, and if you stroke the real hand and the fake hand out of time, the idea is it's much a weaker experience. Now, this is a nice story, but the situation is much more complicated in what I think is a very interesting way for our narrative here about predictive perception. As I said, the rubber hand illusion is usually explained purely in terms of multisensory integration. But led by Peter Lush and Zoltan Yenes at Sussex, we wondered, could the rubber hand illusion be driven in part by top-down expectations about what people ought to experience? If you think about it, the rubber hand illusion setup is very, very riven with demand characteristics. You're in a situation where you're seeing a fake hand, you're seeing it being stroked, you're feeling a touch, and then an experimenter basically asks you, what do you, what do you reckon about that hand? Is it yours? This is a situation where you might be induced to have experiences simply through the setup of the experiment. So to investigate that, we did the rubber hand illusion on over 350 people measuring the extent to which they experienced uh, the illusion. And we also measured how suggestible they are in, ter in terms of hypnotic suggestibility or what uh, Pete and Zoltan and we all now call phenomenological control, the ability of people to involuntarily control what they experience in response to suggestion. And what we found was very clear. There's a strong correlation between the uh, degree to which people experience the rubber hand illusion and how hypnotizable they are. So a lot of it seems to be driven by just people having the experiences they, that they are suggested to have by the design of the experiment. Um, you also notice here, that's the orange arrow, you also notice here that there's still a big difference between synchronous stroking, where both hands are stroked in time, and asynchronous stroking across levels of hypnotizability. But that also makes sense in a separate experiment Peter just measured what people would expect to experience just by asking them what they would expect to experience in the synchronous versus asynchronous case. And what's clear is that when you stroke the hand synchronously, people expect to experience a strong illusion compared to when you do it asynchronously. So this too can be understood in terms of demand uh, characteristics. So the synchronous and asynchronous condition are not well balanced. I think there's a, a really important lesson here, which has become clear certainly to me over the last uh, couple of years while we've been doing this, which is in studies where, that, where we're completely, or where to a large extent, we're really relying on what people say about their experience. We need to be very, very careful about controlling for uh, demand characteristics because people may generate experiences in response to these demand characteristics if they are suggestible. It wasn't only in the rubber hand illusion, by the way, that we found these correlations. It applied also to vicarious pain where people experience pain or report experiencing pain when they see videos of other people in pain. And in mirror synesthesia where people report feeling touch when they see videos of other people uh, being touched. Now, this is both a challenge for these embodiment studies that we have to be very careful about demand characteristics, but it's also an opportunity because you can think of suggestibility or phenomenological control as a very strong trait for the influence of top-down predictions on experience. We can think of uh, individual traits in suggestibility amplifying perceptual predictions in ways that are not consciously accessible to the subject. So I think there's a really interesting way in which we can combine bottom-up manipulations with individual differences in phenomenological control to understand how top-down and bottom-up factors uh, combine to shape perceptual experience. Okay, in the last five minutes of the talk, I'm going to delve into the interior of the body and talk about selfhood and being a beast machine. The rubber hand illusion and 
things like that are all about the experience of having a body. The body is an object in the world. But there is a deeper sense of experiencing being a self in terms of simply being a body, just being a living organism without shape or form. Emotions and moods are part of this part of selfhood, but even below those experiences, there's a what I would call a shapeless, formless experience of just being a living organism, which could be the very base of conscious selfhood. Talking about experiencing the body from within highlights interoception. Interoception is a whole raft of different kinds of perception that are all to do with sensing, perceiving, and controlling the internal physiological condition of the body, the body from uh, within. Now, interoception has already been very closely tied with emotion and mood and so on. But if we think about how interoception might work, well, the same story applies. We can think of interoception as again involving a cycle of prediction and prediction error, but now this is a cycle that takes place within the body. The brain is making predictions about the causes of interoceptive signals, and interoceptive signals constitute prediction errors. So we can have something that we might call interoceptive inference here. It's predictive processing applied to interoception. There's something very distinctive about interoceptive inference, though, which is that it exemplifies what's been called active inference. And this, so there's two ways to minimize prediction error in predictive processing. You can update your predictions or you can change the data so that your existing predictions are fulfilled. And that's active inference, making actions to reduce prediction error. And active inference is all about control. If you have a prediction, it can be a prediction that you want the body to be in a particular state. And then by updating the body until it is in that state, well, you've minimized prediction error and you've controlled the internal milieu of the body. Interoceptive predictions in this sense are instrumental rather than epistemic. That's to say they're about controlling things rather than finding things out. There's a very rich tradition of modeling and theory that underwrite this perspective that goes right back to cybernetics in the mid 20th century, work by Ross Ashby and Roger Conant that suggests that every good regulator of a system is a model of that system. And in order to control something, you have to be able to predict what it's going to do. So prediction is intimately tied up with regulation, with control. And my thought here is that interoceptive inference is all about the predictive regulation of the physiological essential variables, those things like heart rate and blood pressure and blood osmolality, things that have to stay within tight bounds for us to stay alive. Now, just to unpack what this might mean, what it might mean is that it explains, at least in principle, the difference between different kinds of experiences. So visual predictions underpin visual perceptual experiences, which it's about finding out things to a first approximation, where things are in the world, what shape they are. Our visual experience is about what's there. But interoceptive predictions being about control are more about what's going on rather than what's there. And so they underpin embodied experiences, things like emotions, moods, experiences that have valence rather than shape or location at their center. The nice thing for me here is that we have a single process of predictive perception, but if we think about it in different ways, we can see how different kinds of experience might be supported by different kinds of prediction. And the most speculative claim here that I'm going to end with is that this goes all the way through. That staying alive, this fundamental duty of a brain, entails uh, mechanisms in the brain that control predictively physiological essential variables. That's what brains do. They regulate the internal physiology. And this is where the deepest levels of embodied selfhood are to be found. They rest on these control-oriented interoceptive predictions. Again, this is, this is a speculative idea. But all the rest from this follows. Given that that's the primary duty of the brain, and that that's the origin then of these uh, predictive mechanisms in the regulation of the body, all our perceptual experience, whether it's of the self or the world, all of it is grounded in this biological drive to stay alive. We perceive the world around us and ourselves within it with, through, and because of our living bodies. And this is where we get back to the title of the talk and this idea of being a beast machine. Let me just finish with this. So René Descartes 
was very famous, of course, for distinguishing between matter stuff and mind stuff, res cogitans and res extensa. But he also made a sharp distinction between mind and life. And this was very clear in how he uh, wrote about non-human animals. He said, without minds to direct their bodily movements, animals must be regarded as unthinking, unfeeling machines that move like clockwork. So for Descartes, the flesh and blood nature of an animal was no indication of the presence of a mind or of any kind of uh, consciousness, certainly not the kind of human consciousness that he was concerned about. Uh, he called animals beast machines. That's where the word comes from. I think it might be entirely the opposite. In the story that I've been talking about today, conscious selfhood emerges because of and not in spite of our beast machine nature. We perceive the world and the self with, through, and because of our living bodies. Let me summarize and return to the four points I wanted to hit. The first is there is a pragmatic approach to studying consciousness in psychology and neuroscience. This, I've called it the real problem. Other people call it other things, the mapping problem. Instead of explaining why consciousness is part of the universe, let's just account for its various properties in terms of mechanisms. Talked about conscious content, and here I think a very powerful methodology is the use of computational models to model different kinds of phenomenal experience. This can be computational phenomenology or computational neurophenomenology. Then there's conscious self. And here the core idea is the self is a perception too. And certainly uh, one point I highlighted is that in a lot of experiments of the experience of selfhood, we need to be very much aware of the influence and opportunity of demand characteristics in shaping these experiences. And finally, there's the point about being a beast machine, tracing the somatic roots of selfhood and perhaps all of consciousness to the brain as fundamentally involved in predictive regulation of the interior of the body. So I'm a little over time, I apologize. I wanted to thank uh, people in the lab um, and the people listed who, whose work I've spoken about today. And I will leave it there again with the details and uh, the book coming up in September. Thank you for listening. I'll leave it there. So thank you very much, Anil, for a really, really thought-provoking talk covering covering many aspects, and I think very insightful for um, neuroscientists like me, um, more kind of bogged down in the nuts and bolts of, of brain function and anatomy. Um, so we've got a lot of questions uh, coming in. Um, so the first one I'm going to put to you, which I think is quite thought provoking from Stephen West. How can you be sure that life is not consciousness? How do you know that the bacterial cell doesn't have a conscious experience, for example? That's a, a good question. Um... I'm not certain about that. I don't think I I said that. If I did, I didn't mean to say that. There is a position that argues that, which is called um, biopsychism, which is sort of the idea that life is coextensive with consciousness, that everything that is alive is somehow uh, conscious. And uh, there's another slightly weaker position, which is that life is necessary for consciousness, that only living things can be conscious. I'm a bit agnostic about that as well. In fact, the thing I'm, I'm arguing really is that we can only understand the nature of, of human consciousness or, or any system that we feel confident in that, that, that it is conscious, like a primates, other mammals, and so on, in virtue of their living nature. So it's, it's to understand the mechanisms of perception, the things that shape conscious experiences, those will only unreveal their secrets if we understand their, their origin evolutionarily and developmentally in regulation of the living body. It's a slightly different claim to then say, you have to be alive to be conscious. I think that that might be the case. The only systems we know of that are conscious are, are living. Um, and the thing about living systems is they're fundamentally different from this kind of computational metaphor. They bring us outside of this, this temptation to think of the brain as some kind of computer, because there's no sharp distinction between 
the mind, mindware and wetware as there is between sort of software and hardware in a, in a computer. So there's regulatory mechanisms that underpin life. They go all the way down and you don't know where to, where to draw the line and say the substrate doesn't matter anymore. As to which, how far the circle of consciousness extends, I think this is almost an unanswerable question and it's very tempting to try to put a line somewhere, but I think it's, it's, it's something we have to be very careful about. And, uh, yeah, I try and keep a little bit grounded by landmarks that we can be reasonably sure of that, that the difference between being conscious as we are now and being unconscious, let's say in general anesthesia, that's a difference that we can, we can sort of remain grounded. If there is something it is like to be a single bacterium, it's a very, very different kind of thing compared to what it is like to be uh, a mammal. And so that's a whole different set of questions that, that I'm not really addressing here. Thank you. Next question comes from Virginia Metodieva. She's asking, do you think that experience duration is also connected to finding something interesting? How does this connect to salience? Oh, this is a good question. So this is related to the work mainly led by Warwick uh, Roseboom in, in, in the lab, who's been pioneering this stuff for a long time now. I mean, the two, just to recap very briefly, I mean, the, the sort of classical perspective on time perception is that it's with reference to some kind of internal clock that ticks away and marks out durations that we then experience as durations. Uh, and trying to move away from that, that explanation is what we've been, what we've been doing. It doesn't really explain anything, like having a clock in the head uh, it, we, well, we have a circadian rhythm, but when we're thinking about durations in the order of seconds, it's very unclear that they're underpinned by an internal clock. So they are, we're finding evidence that these experiences of duration are inferences about the rate of change of salient events in perceptual processing. Um, and so salience is intrinsic to this and salience can be defined in many ways. It can be defined in a kind of bottom up way about what's happening in sensory streams, but also it depends on our goals as well. So what becomes salient depends on what we're, what we're trying to do. Um, so when something interesting happens, this may well affect uh, our experience of duration because it will, it will change what kinds of sensory transitions uh, become become meaningful but I think more importantly it will also it will also change how we group perceptual streams into discrete events there's there's a there's I think a really interesting crossover between what how we perceive duration and how we cluster durations into discrete episodes that we then remember in episodic autobiographical memory um, and Warwick and, and, and colleagues of ours are trying to build now a an integrated model where we where we account for both the uh, flow of experience duration and a grouping of a continuous stream of sensory input or sensory motor activity into the discrete events that we later remember as as individual episodes. Thank you. Next question comes from Nur Shaheen who's asking about the implications of this on individuals who have some form of visual impairment. Does it affect their perception of duration? Oh, uh, <clears throat> that's linking two things which I hadn't thought to link actually, because we, we're certainly very interested in people with unusual visual experiences, whether they're, whether they're deemed pathological or, or sort of a, you know, some sort of neuropsychiatric problem such as in hallucination and psychosis, or whether they're unusual in a different way, like in synesthesia or in psychedelic experiences. But quite how that links to experience of duration is, I'm, I, I don't know, I, I'd have to, I don't, nothing comes to mind, but it's very interesting actually, because you would imagine that if the way you're processing, let's say visual information is changing, then that should predict changes in, in experience duration as well. So that's certainly something to look at. Thanks. Um, so I'm going to go to a question next from Amber Besseling, who asks, um, who says, thank you for this great talk. Do you think inter-individual differences in interoceptive capabilities should be accounted for in studies of perception? If so, how? So this is a really interesting and important question. Um, I, I think they almost certainly, well, the basic answer is yes, right? These things, uh, 
at least on my the story I've been telling, and I think a lot of other people have been working in this area too. It's certainly at Sussex, you go Critchley and Sarah Garfinkel now at UCL and lots of other groups have been looking at these interactions. Um, the problem is that it's been just very, very difficult to reliably characterize individual differences in interoceptive uh, sensitivity. Um, they typically rely on things like counting or discriminating heartbeat uh, measures. And those, you, there's a lot of discussion about how accurate and how reliable these are. Other, other methods are being developed, and I think this is very promising. Um, we've, we've done some work in the past looking at, for instance, how people experience the rubber hand illusion, how that depends on their interoceptive sensitivity. But I would like to revisit that kind of work because I'm, I'm just convinced that what we need are improved methods for characterizing interoception and its inter-individual inter uh, variants. And those methods are being developed by a number of people now. So I think it's somewhat promising. Thank you. So I'm going to go to a question next from Soraya Dunn, who says, great talk. Have you heard of the living mirror theory of consciousness? Your abstract reminded me of it, published in the Journal of Consciousness Studies. I haven't, so I'm, I'll look at that, <laughs> but I, I don't want to just <laughs> try, and, try and guess what it is. I'm afraid I don't know that theory, no. Okay, thank you. Um, so Kevin Marinus next says, a great talk. What are your thoughts on global neuronal workspace theory and phi? <laughs> question mark okay this is so so i'm gonna, right so these are theories i didn't talk about right so these are sort of alternative theories of consciousness i think one thing to say is that one of the issues in consciousness science that, that i think this question brings up and i'll answer it directly in a second is that um there are lots of theories and they're they're often theories of different things they make different assumptions and they they target different aspects of of consciousness so global neuronal workspace theory which was originated in, uh, in Bernard Barr's psychological framework in the 80s, and Stan DeHane has taken it forward in a neuroscientific way uh, in the 90s and, and from then on, is a theory that says you're conscious of something, of some information, when that information gains access to and is broadcasted within a widespread network uh, in the brain, in the frontal and parietal regions. There's a lot of compelling experimental evidence for this if you contrast conscious versus unconscious perception. But it's also unclear that it's, well, it seems to be more a theory of what philosophers call access consciousness rather than phenomenal consciousness, right? It tells you whether you're going to be aware of something or not, and then what you can do when you are aware of it, you can behave very flexibly but it doesn't really give you a good idea of why experiences are the way they are, like why a visual experience is, has the character that it does compared to an emotional experience. So it's a theory of the sort of functional aspects of consciousness. Phi, which comes from Giulio Tononi's integrated information theory, is for me a fascinating set of ideas uh, that has at its core this observation about experience again, that every conscious experience we have is both highly informative for an organism and highly integrated, we experience a unified scene. And it comes up with, com with quite complicated mathematical ways to measure that. The thing I would say about that is that uh, there are actually many ways to write down this phi quantity, or, or many ways to characterize this balance between integration and, and information. And you, they don't all have to be the same way that Giulio Tononi has, has been proposing, which is a very interesting way. But the problem with that is it's very difficult to test. So with Adam Barrett and uh, Pedro Mediano and my colleagues uh, in, in the UK, we've been trying to come up with more pragmatic approaches, which, which still retain this essential insight that conscious experiences are integrated and informative, but are easier to measure. And so it's, it's, a, like a, it's the same strategy that underpins everything else that I've been doing, really, which is you... you you weaken what you you weaken a little bit what you're trying to explain. So I'm not saying that these other ways of measuring phi can tell you whether a computer is conscious or not. No, it's a bit weaker than that. But you can use them in practice uh, in an easier way. So it's a more pragmatic attitude that retains the insights, but is not so sort of metaphysically ambitious. Thank you. 
So I wanted to ask you a question actually about how consciousness really relates to um, net, neuro, neuronal networks in the in the cortex and neuroanatomy. So I think, you know, um, philosophers and so on used to think there was going to be some sort of locus of, uh, of consciousness in the brain that we would discover. And clearly we now know it's much more complicated than that. But we think about these streams of of sensory information coming in that you described and then being integrated somehow. Um, so, I mean, would you see consciousness within the cortex as a really a, as a widely distributed property, and it's not useful to think about it in terms of um, location, or would you say there are you know certain brain regions which are really pivotal in in this? Yeah, this is a lovely question. I think that there's been this pragmatic um, turn from the late 90s or the 90s onwards, where people looked for the neural correlates of consciousness, which were usually interpreted in terms of areas, right? So it would be this question about, is V1 necessary for visual consciousness or is prefrontal cortex necessary for, for conscious perception? Um, these are still useful questions to ask and debates still revolve. But but I think the, the idea of what, how to characterize a neural correlate is moving away from specific areas to indeed patterns of activity. And these patterns of activity might not be completely arbitrary with respect to, to areas. In fact, they're almost certainly not. Um, but it's probably a more power, explanatorily and predictably powerful place to look is in terms of what patterns of activity go along with and actually explain features of consciousness rather than purely which area uh, is, in, is you know, what's the seat of consciousness in terms of a specific area or a collection of areas. Having said that, contrast between different theories often still come down to this. So if you, there's a big project underway um, to compare integrated information theory with global workspace theory. And in large part, that's coming down to seeing whether the, the observed neural correlates are more in the front of the brain compared to the back of the brain. You know, that, that's a sort of first step. And I don't think, I mean, it wouldn't be satisfying, right? If you just, if we knew that, okay, the seed of consciousness is indeed in the lateral prefrontal cortex. Um, without a strong explanatory framework ex that, that indicates why and how that should be so, uh, by itself, it's not really good enough. Thank you very much. So we're, we're up against a hard stop in about three minutes. It, maybe we could just fit in one last question. But before we do that, um, I'd like to just mention that Anil will be having a Zoom session, I think, at five o'clock today. Yeah. Um, and he's uh, either posted that into the uh, mm. chat already or it will be put onto the site, onto the festival website attached to this, um, this session. So you will be able to find it and Anil will be available to talk further um, with those who I know there are quite a lot of questions and some of them were truncated on my feed so I couldn't completely see them which um, you can um, then put your questions in person and have a have a further discussion um, so we had one last question so perhaps a very short answer as well to this from Ian Hartnell saying um, animal behavior research the mirror test the ability of an animal to recognize itself in a mirror is predictive of consciousness. What are your thoughts about this? Well, I don't think it is predictive of consciousness. I think the, the mirror test is interesting, but it, it's to the, to the extent it tells us anything, it tells us about a very specific part of being conscious, which is the ability to recognize oneself as distinct from an, from an image of oneself, as, as separate from other entities that might appear similar. Um, I certainly don't think the mirror test is a criterion for an organism uh, being conscious. Very few creatures uh, reliably pass it. There's continuing controversy over which do and, and which don't. But certainly not many creatures spontaneously and reliably share evidence of mirror self-recognition, which I think is, is, is very interesting, but it certainly doesn't underwrite claims that all those creatures that fail to pass the test are are unconscious. No, they just lack a certain aspect of, of, of higher order self-awareness. Thank you very much. So I think that's a very good note to end on. Um, and I'd just like to thank uh, Anne very, very much for this fantastic lecture uh, to begin the plenaries in this in this meeting.
and all of you for attending and posting your questions. And hopefully this will prompt a lot more discussion between yourselves um, and uh, in the session later. So, so thank you very much indeed. And thank you very much, Sarah, for, for hosting. Thank you everyone for coming and the BNA for inviting. And uh, I do believe their link has been posted in the chat. So happy to have a follow up chat with whoever wants to turn up at five this afternoon. Thank you again. Have a lovely day. Great. Thanks a lot.